So a year has passed. A year. In this very natural setting where we walk and talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that we both have the Corona cut. <laughs> I'm not even going to take my hat we off. We look like a knockoff Hall & Oates cover band. <laughs> But you've been here, you've been here the whole time. While yeah. all this has been going on, you even moved from one part of London to another in yeah. the middle of the pandemic. You know, even if things are opening up, does it feel like old London? Does it feel like things how they used to be? I don't know, it's quite difficult. It's almost like I can't remember what old London was like. Like, that's interesting. We've been taking advantage of the fact that we can sit outdoors in pubs now and stuff. But even the context of that, when you have to book it, and then, you know, yeah. sit there and you, often it's booked for weeks as it is. And then if you get a table, you have it for two hours and you're asked to leave. We went to a restaurant on Friday night and they were so quick to turn us over because they need to fill the tables. They yeah. haven't got many. They yeah. need to make money on that night. And it feels like all the spontaneity that London is so good for yeah. is still like being compromised. But you can't lump blame on any vendor for that. Yeah. It's just these awful circumstances that we still find ourselves in. I think it's going to be months until we actually realize we're back to any semblance of normality. But maybe we said that last year. Well, I know. I think you're right. I mean, I've, I've been to Bar Market a couple of times, even in the last month, and the whole experience has completely changed. This is a place I love. It's, one, it's like Mecca for me. Yeah. And it's all one-way systems and people barking at your face through megaphones to not go this way, not go that way. And yeah, it's tough. Like so much of what we do in a hospitality or, you know, enjoying hospitality, is to relax and yeah. if you're being ferried around and ushered into different places people are stressed by default because they they do have money to make or you are encroaching on their time or their space yeah it's just incredibly different to the kind of the the modus operandi of hospitality before was to enjoy yourself and chill not to get in there eat your food get out and yeah. then say you did it and constantly looking over your shoulder to see if anybody's too close yeah you know? Yeah, that's true. So you can true. never really relax. And I, I mean, that's going to be the same around the world. But I've, you know, as we move towards opening the country up, I think I, I certainly feel like, you know, an animal that they're trying to release back into the wild that just won't come out of its cage. I'm yeah. like, I'm good. We've become germaphobes. You know, I yeah. go into my flat and I don't feel comfortable until I've put disinfectant on my hands yeah. and elsewhere as well. And if people are in my space, there was a guy without a mask on the train coming over here and like it just felt really uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think it's going to be a while till we can all sit in a restaurant inches from each other. Yeah. Oh. And not feel completely like uncomfortable and exposed and vulnerable. Yeah. Well, I think that, yeah, and overwhelmed. You sort of, you see a person like down on public transport and I want to ask you about that in a second. And you're like, there's obviously a reason why they've chosen, like, you know, yeah. whatever. But I also kind of want them to get struck by lightning. You 100%. Know? And I'm, <laughs> but I'm the worst type of person for that because I'm English. And maybe it's something to do with, like, maybe the politics of London are so different as well. But you're so restrained to say anything. Mm. Like, I wonder, like, when you go to America, is it different? Do they say, do people catch people out and say, why aren't you wearing a mask? It's usually the other way around when you have the, the mask people, the mask less people. Why are you wearing yeah, a mask? Yeah, what's wrong with you? Yeah, I've seen those videos as well. Like, it's really competent. We don't have that here and we should be proud of it. That's one thing yeah. <laughs> we can be proud of over here. But it was interesting, like, after we filmed in London, um, both times, because we did it over a couple of days, Yeah. you and I both sort of tentatively said to each other, I didn't like doing that. Like, yeah. there was almost a sense of agoraphobia of yeah. not having left our, our homes and flats for a long time. Yeah. And then having to go out and be close to people and uh, on Hackney High Street and just sort of, there's a lot of people here and I kind of don't want to be here anymore. I think some of that agoraphobia is like really ever more present because what we were doing that felt so unnatural was what we were so used to doing and felt incredibly natural yeah. for like 20 countries more than that across the world. And we're doing exactly the same approach that we normally do, but suddenly it felt really dangerous or just a little bit unnatural and weird. Yeah. I think that kind of polarity was so present and we're just like, wow, normally we do this and it's so easy and Especially so natural. Especially in a city like London where in many cases, you don't really have a choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of being close to people. That, I mean, that's the attraction, right? You go into a crowded bar or somewhere like Bar Market 
or anywhere in between the tube and, and that's the that's the attraction the the camaraderie the, the shared experience and now you're actively trying to avoid situations like yeah. that yeah uh, oh, whether you've had the jab or not because you've had yours yeah. and i've had mine yeah. it doesn't change anything in fact you're too close right now <laughs> <laughs> when we've done such a great job in this country of the rolling out the vaccine and i think everybody i know you know my peer group has had at least one yeah. you know obviously everybody older has still not massively excited about going out into the world just yet and it's yeah 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 it's still just so many unknowns and i think a lot of it is imprinted on our psyche now that being close to somebody equals bad yeah <laughs> and i think it's going to take a long time to undo that and that's like a real threat to the hospitality sector it's been a year have have you seen an evolution in the way you get your food yeah to your house totally. and, and you know the availability of it and what's you know, how have they innovated, how have they changed things, what's worked, what hasn't worked? The way I've enjoyed food has really altered. When we first were in lockdown, we saw it as just a great opportunity to get takeaway and like feel, feel good about it. And yeah, like, you're doing, you know, the, doing your bit. Doing a bit. And then, you know, there was no shame in it because like, what else can you do? If you want to have that experience, you're not going to a restaurant. Yeah. But then I don't know if this is like indicative of like everybody's experience but it, it got less and less satisfying and I think we got much more into like cooking for ourselves and we're like ah oh, this is almost as good as I can remember having in a restaurant and that isn't testament to the fact that we're good chefs it's just that we never had the time to put that much love into a recipe before yeah and that became the preference over getting like a, a, a delivery or like an uber eats or something like that and even though like restaurants like really pivoted and were amazing at adapting, I wonder if they've seen that drop off as well. If people were really hyped about takeaway for so long and then it started to peter out a little bit. Yeah. Because I definitely the buzz has kind of gone for me and probably just in time because now they're open again. I think, you know, it's easy for, for people like me to armchair analyze the economic well, you don't have to pay this member staff and this and this and this and this and you know but people can you can still employ your your chefs yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course you know they just had to, to, to pivot a little bit yeah but what you've just said reinforces the point that food is as much about the experience as it is about the food yeah hundred yeah. percent like I'd much rather especially in London go to a restaurant to eat their food yeah. than have it come to me no discredit to those services but have it come to me slightly colder yeah and then you don't have the presentation, which is such a large part of Or the food. curation where the waiter or waitress says, this is really good, yeah. or I'm really, you know, this is selling really well, or I'm digging this myself, or this be it'll go really well with this beer. You don't have that. Yeah, there's no conversation. No. It's like that, what food is for so many cultures is the conversation that goes around it. We're lacking in that. Yeah. I do really miss that. And I think that's one of the things that I'm most excited about getting back to restaurants for. It's funny just sitting in pub gardens and be able to order bar snacks and stuff. That's exciting. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't think I would have ever put that much impetus on like some chips at a pub before, but now it feels like a luxury. So yeah. like going to a full blown restaurant, sitting indoors as it's meant to, that's going to feel wild, I think. A reliable and trustworthy VPN is pretty much a requirement these days. I use one every day, whether I'm at home or when I'm traveling, and my weapon of choice is private internet access. Available on all platforms, including Windows, Mac, and iOS, you can protect up to 10 devices at once with just one PIA subscription. I can watch my favorite Netflix shows no matter where I am without those annoying geographic restrictions. And these days, when we're super focused on our privacy, it's reassuring to know that PIA have a strict no logs policy and they protect against malware, ads, and trackers, so you can use that sketchy airport Wi-Fi without any worries about your privacy and security. They've got 20,000 servers in over 70 countries, and if you use the exclusive link in the show notes below, you can get total internet security for just three US dollars a month, plus three months free. And that's all backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Check it out. When London went into lockdown, everything was off the menu, literally and figuratively. Yeah. And as it went, crept on and crept on and crept on, did you find yourself looking at things that you'd thought 
I'll do that next time, or I don't really have time to do that, that you just, you needed, that, yeah. we're, that we're inaccessible, that we're very London. I feel like there's always that pressure to do things when you're in London because you're paying such a high rent and you think, why am I here if I'm not taking advantage of it? But having said that, it wasn't until I was in lockdown where I realized how much I'd let slip my taking advantage of London. And there are things that I'd not done for a while, guiltily, admittedly, I'd not been to like a museum for a while. And suddenly those places just felt like the most alluring thing ever because you can't have them suddenly. So yeah, galleries, museums, all these places feel like so out of reach at the moment. And I'd love to go to them, not to mention gigs, which were actually like a huge part of my life before lockdown. Being so close to people, the idea of like someone moshing next to you or something, mad. They're sweat so, getting in your eyeballs. <laughs> they're sweating my eyeballs, which was always what was happening at gigs. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think there are a lot of things that I always thought I was going to do. Uh, and, and I would imagine cinema for you. Cinema is a big one. Yeah, I was thinking about this as well because like, I wish I was more of the person who would just go to the cinema readily, whether something's on or not. But I feel like the allure of it has a lot to do with what film is being pushed at me. Sure. So that one I haven't missed as much, but I'm sure as soon as I get in there, I'll be like, oh my God, this has been such a hole in my life. Yeah. Uh, when Bond finally comes out, which should probably be like in five years time. Yeah. It's funny, these things that attribute quite a lot to our personalities, I think, and we've just not been able to do them. So something else has to take its place or you just kind of cryogenically freeze that asset of your identity. Whenever it was that they slightly loosened things, just have made a beeline for all the bookstores that I love. It's great. But I mean, have there been places that you have discovered? This is one of them. Yeah. So this is Dusty Knuckle and they also have um, 40 Foot Brewery, which is kind of just behind camera. And it's called 40 Foot Brewery because it was done in one of those storage containers, which is literally 40 foot long. So it was a microbrewery. Brewery. Yeah. Oh, like, wow. tot- like really is a microbrewery. And they kind of have been sharing this courtyard and they work together and the food is amazing. And actually during lockdown, Dusty Knuckle, like a lot of bakeries, boomed. And they would park up their, their truck and you could go pick up fresh focaccia and it felt like a little bit of a breath of the old world. So that was a nice lifeline to have. So coming here in the flesh is like a nice kind of reintroduction to that world. Yeah. Even though the food is slightly familiar, the experience isn't. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. like, this is a great example of like a makeshift outdoor space that has popped up all over, not all over, but over London and all over the country as well. And works so well. Yeah. And also just that adaptability, like 40 Foot did this amazing thing during lockdown where they were like, if you buy a voucher, will double its worth when you come in. So I spent 30 pounds on beer vouchers and I could redeem that for 60 pounds worth of beer now, right now. Right, wow. This is when the video is gonna change. <laughs> and we're gonna drink every last drop of it. There were these businesses that, that saw it as a chance to experiment and innovate. Otherwise, they'd probably die. So what do you have to lose? Yeah, exactly. You adapt and you survive. And sometimes some really clever ideas come from it as well. Like that benefits them and it really benefits yes. us. Because you're telling me, and. 185,000 people yeah. about that type of thing. Right? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. And then it balloons and they get so many vouchers spent and they, you know, they can deal with the markup. It all works. I think that's another thing that I've, I've, I've enjoyed and that London has done really well is taking what's good about a restaurant or in, even in some cases bars and put them in front and remove the physical barrier of the shop so you don't have to, you know, book two months in advance and also put great things in front of a lot more people who maybe be walking by. And I'm hoping, I think, that the takeaway booze idea remains. Yeah, you've got to hope that some of these things stick around because it is really nice to be able to get a takeaway pint and go into the park with your mates. And that's something I didn't really do before. I always stuck for like going to a beer garden or or going into the pub on like a hot day. You realize with some perspective now that there's so much open space available to us. And sometimes it's the better option and it's actually kind of mad to think that pubs weren't doing takeaway pints like that before. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a public health policy to say that if you're, con- you know, their licensing extends to certain places. We don't have open container laws in this country, but it was sort of implied. Yeah. And then we realized what, you know, what is, what is better for the greater public health, being able to take it and go somewhere where there's space or sitting next to people and coughing on them during the <laughs> middle of a pandemic. And I think we made a really good choice. And I'm hoping especially as we come into the summer, that that's the solution going forward, is that you can go and get a cocktail in a, in a takeaway cup or a beer or whatever your jam is and go and sit in one of the amazing 
parks and common grounds? Yeah, I mean, I think there is an upside as well. Like you say, like people have rediscovered the parks in a way that they hadn't before. I think they're being taken for granted and now they're like busting at the seams. So if there's a way that you can intrinsically link the hospitality sector with that and make them into more of a venue, not in like a cynical way, but like just in a way that actually puts them to use. This yeah. is great. I'm hoping that's one of the things that we, we keep when we don't just immediately reset to zero again and, and, and lose the innovation that we had, not just in the restaurant space, but, but generally. Yeah, yeah, I think we've had to adapt. We've learned a lot of things. A lot of those things will become moot, but I think it would be a shame, like you say, to forget about all of it. And we should probably find a nice in-between, yeah. a middle ground. I sure hope so.